They lifted their first European Cup in 1977, and just seven years later, Liverpool Football Club won the famous trophy for a fourth time. Throughout that period, they collected major honours every single season and in the process established themselves as European football's dominant force. For an English club, it was an unprecedented level of consistent success, something to rank with the best runs in football history. how great they were. But at the time, you, you, you just seemed to take it for granted because Liverpool at that time were the club to play for. They were the dominant team, had the best players, and it was an absolute disaster if at the end of the season only only had one, one trophy, you know. It was just, you were expected to win things. May 1984, in Rome's Olympic Stadium, Graham Souness lifted Liverpool's fourth European Cup. But the seeds of such success had been planted more than a decade earlier. In 1974, Bob Paisley was promoted from assistant following the shock resignation of one of football's most celebrated managers, Bill Shankly. He came in and quite simply said, he said, look lads, you know, Shanks has gone, uh, none of us wanted that. Certainly I didn't want it, um, but he has, and somebody's got to take this club on. Um, and he said, I'm the one that's going to do it. But he said, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to change anything. He always felt that continuity was, was the right thing at the football club. Shanks had been there long enough to sort of, he'd set the foundations, and I don't just mean that's foundations, you know, the football club and he changed, you know, the, the training complex and this, that and the other. Bill Shankly made Liverpool into a club universally known and respected and a power. But Bob Paisley made them a great European power, the kings of the continent. But Paisley did not work alone. The club's commitment to continuity also applied to his backroom staff. Joe Fagan, Ronnie Moran and Roy Evans would end up with over 100 years of Anfield service between them. Within two years, Paisley led the Reds to the UEFA Cup and league title. But the following season proved to be even more significant. Liverpool again captured the league championship. A bigger prize still lay ahead. The European Cup final in 1977, you just knew everybody was so excited. This was a culmination of everything, what Shanks, what Bob, what Joe and Ronnie and the board had all worked for. It showed you how far they'd developed from the team Shanks had left behind in 74. Three years later, there was this fantastic team, much more sophisticated than the one Shanks had left. Bob had moved it on into that European level, which it needed, obviously. Thousands of home for the club's first ever European Cup final. Highway! Slots it through to Terry McDermott, who strikes for Liverpool! Tommy Smith, oh, he's scored! Smith of all people! And up comes Phil Neal, and surely now, Liverpool are heading for European glory! West German champions Borussia Mönchengladbach were soundly beaten 3-1. To win that, European Cup was a special, special event, a special event for everybody. It was a fantastic performance by Liverpool. It was one of those perfect occasions. The weather was good, the fans were impeccable, the opposition was quite testing, but a brilliant side much in Gladbach. A domestic and European double had been achieved once again, only this time Liverpool were European champions. 
By now, the club's team before individual ethos was well established. Even the departure of the talisman Kevin Keegan caused a minimum of fuss. Kenny Dalglish arrived from Celtic for a British record transfer fee in the summer of 1977 and was joined at Anfield by two more Scots. All three would have historic impact. Great players were replaced, they came and went, but the spirit in that dressing room was saying to none, it really was, it was like phenomenal. My first game for Liverpool, I plucked up the courage to do I trained for a week. No one's told me what you want me to do. And a big booming voice, I can't tell you the first two words he said, but the, the second word was off. And it was, we paid all this money for you and you're asking me how to play football and walked away. And by that time, all the lads were looking at me laughing. So I never, ever asked again. The first day we came training, the lads were as hungry for success that year as what they must have been the previous year. So, oh, that's what they made. Liverpool reached the European Cup final again in 1978 and against FC Bruges at Wembley, were bidding to become the first British team to retain the trophy. Kenny Dalglish was proving a bargain. I had my back to goal on the, on the goal line and I don't know, it was Terry Mike chipped in or something. I knocked it in, oh, with my chest and then volleyed it over my head just into the box and one of the lads headed it out. I went to Graham, he came out with the back four and Graham just pushed it through into space. The keeper can run it out in another angle, but I just waited for him to go down and then lift it over the top. And... A one nothing win meant a hero's welcome back on Merseyside. It was becoming a familiar sight. The manager, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan, Ronnie Moran, who the players had more sort of interaction with every day, they kept it very simple. There was no magic formula. The great players sacrificed any, anything on an individual basis for the team. I never liked running a bit much, but I really enjoyed the training, you know, the laughter, the, the togetherness. <laughs> That's not very nice, is it? Hey, you weren't here when I used to you stand You weren't here, here, lad. You never used to stand on here. No. Pride and joy, this lad. But hard work and team spirit weren't enough on their own. Trevor Francis regularly faced the Reds. Any good team, you build from the back. And I think of the likes of, you know, Clements. Great goalkeeper. You look at goalkeepers, you think there's a mistake there, or he's going to save us. And Clem is that every time. He's going to save us. He's going to get us at the line. Alan Kennedy was an attacking left back. He was a fantastic guy, and he was a great player. The goals he scored, and, and obviously the big cup finals, were great. Great left foot, good defender, and, and great pace. And uh, that's what you want a fullback. There was Neil. What a sign, and he was. People don't realise, 23 years of age, and he's played all these games and won all these medals. For me, he was absolutely wonderful and top class. Phil Thompson and myself were, were, I think, the best partnership I played. Tom and I were like, it was telepathic. I mean, we played a, a team that, in 42 league games, lost 16 goals. And it was just, he was just unbelievable to play with. My strong points were definitely my positioning and reading and on the ball, and he was the same. Terry McDermott from the centre of midfield, we had a bet at the start of every season, two of us in the centre of midfield, who would score the most goals? It was a joke. I would get six, he'd get 26. And by Christmas time, he'd be holding his hand out and I'd have to pay him. You know, he'd sit in front of the lad, so I couldn't refuse the bet. Every pre-season, every Christmas time, I paid up. Case, McDermott, Sunis, Ray Kennedy, they had everything in there. They had they had pace in there, they had, they had strength, brilliant in there. Ray Kenny was the best midfield player in there that I've ever seen. But above all, every one of them was totally comfortable with the ball at their feet. And I don't think you'll ever get a better midfield quartet than that. And up front, they had such a cutting edge, you know, the likes of Dalglish and Rush. I mean, those two will go down as two of the all-time greats at, 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 at Anfield. So we are talking. were an integral part of the success story. The backroom staff were, were totally part of everything. You know, we're in this together. It's not just about, it's not the players are there. I mean, there's very much a, you knew it was them and us, but 
when it came to the matters on the pitch, it was like all together, you know, the backroom staff, everybody was involved in it. The likes of, you know, Joe Fagan, Ronnie Morant, Roy Evans, they were absolutely fantastic behind the scenes, just reminded, reminded you what your job is, the badge, and who you're playing for. Nothing's complicated for them. We just go out and try and do the simple things. We try to pass this on to each player individually and net it into a teamwork, and then they go out and they do it. On and off the field, the players knew what was required of them, even if pre-match routines were occasionally unorthodox. When I first went to Liverpool, we'd watch the 2 o'clock race, the 2.15 race, the 2.30 race, and if it was five furlongs, they might get the 2.35, and, but the thing is, like, four players would come in the dressing room and then the manager after, because Bob would be watching the racing as well. Come in, 2.35, so no warm I never used to warm-up, I used to touch my toes, go and play. Always have a sense of Liverpool, if, I mean, within reason, what is right for you, then that's fine. At that time at Liverpool, they give you a responsibility, which I think is missing in the modern game. The one thing they would say to us before we went out on a Saturday at 3 o'clock was be together, and we always were. When you come under pressure, you come under pressure as a team, not as an individual. Successive league titles followed in 1979 and 80. As Liverpool fought to maintain dominance, Brian Clough's hungry Nottingham Forest side were pushing them hard for the major titles. A rivalry flourished, but there was also mutual respect. That Liverpool team never gets the credit for being one of the top sides not only domestically, but in European football, where they've had to come in and play heavy domestic programme, as heavy as any, and, and still come up big in the, in the European games. We had really, really good players, some really, really good players, and some truly great players that could have gone anywhere in the world and gotten any team anywhere in the world at that time. And that, coupled with honesty and hard work, made them a formidable force. They were as good a side that has held that European trophy off, and they were as good a side as any. During this period of relentless domination, the Football League Cup had remained elusive. Alan Hansen's winner in the replayed final of 1981 against West Ham ended that particular drought. The same season also saw Liverpool cruise through to the quarterfinals of the European Cup where a Sunas hat-trick helped them to a 6-1 aggregate success against CSKA Sofia. The resulting semi-final was an epic struggle against West German champions Bayern Munich. We drew a little Anfield, Paul Breitner um, said a few disparaging words about us after the game. We go across there, there's leaflets in every seat in the stadium. So we get a couple of Liverpool supporters who are in early to show us what the, what's in the leaflet. And of course, it's the road to Paris for the final. Well, I've never ever seen a Liverpool dressing, dressing room more fired up than I did that night. It was incredible. The two substitutes had been used, and then Dave Johnson got a hamstring and he was limping in the right wing. So, 10 men, Kenny had gone off, and we scored, and Ruben had scored in the final minute. But it was, it was the best dressing room I've ever been in that dressing room. I mean, they were, Batten the, the Bayern Munich door done, and that everybody's gone crazy. To be part of that was was extra special. That night in, in Munich, it was one of you know one of the great nights in Liverpool's history. That's our 113th European Cup tie, and uh, we all had some great ones. The Rome one in particular was magnificent. But tonight, I thought that was our best performance. Even better was to come as once again the Liverpool supporters travelled in huge numbers to foreign shores. Alan Kennedy's late goal in Paris was enough to beat Spanish giants Real Madrid. I remember Alan Kennedy's goal, but I don't remember too much about. <laughs> don't remember too much about the afterward. That was a good part of it. He always had a. He always had a good celebration. The sad part was you couldn't remember it. Bob Paisley said in. Uh, 77 in Rome. They say they never had a drink. They say they wanted to get drunk in the atmosphere and enjoy the moment and remember it. I never listened to Bob's advice. <laughs> Liverpool's
at that time, they truly believed in us. And um, we believed in them, and I think we proved that, because we didn't lose too many at Anfield. And there was never that feeling coming from the crowd, any part of the stadium, that when we maybe went a goal behind, or we had lost a week before and we weren't playing well, that, that was the, the, the negativity was coming onto the pitch. It was such a great place to play. I mean, the sign, for example, when you walk you know, down the tunnel, I mean, I still touch the sign the same way as I always did on the Saturday. I just, just, I can't get away from, from touching that sign with the two hands like that. It was a period during which Anfield had become something of a fortress. Over the nine seasons from 1975 until 1984, the club played 263 competitive home games and lost only 15. This included an 85-match unbeaten run between 1978 and 1981. The trophies continued to arrive. 1982 brought another league title as Liverpool clinched championship number 13 at home to Tottenham. And the same opponents were on the receiving end as Liverpool lifted their second successive League Cup at Wembley the same season. A 3-1 success achieved with two extra times. By now, one of football's deadliest double acts was in full flow. Ian Rush had joined the club from Chester City in May 1980. His partnership with Kenny Dalgleish has since become You just run into that space. No, so I didn't think no, nothing of it because I thought there's no way the ball would be in that space. So I didn't go when the ball was in that space and uh, he had a bit of a go at me uh, for not being there. So I thought instead of getting another rollicking from him, next time it comes, you know, I'm going to run into that space. Not many people can put the ball into that space, but Kenny was one of them and he wasn't even looking half the time. It's just probably one of the players apart he played in the success of Liverpool Football Club because his movement was brilliant, uh, his pace, it was really sharp and he could finish anyway, right or left foot, even in the air. Of course, Kenny would get his 20 goals plus a year, and Rushy, you know, he, he, he could have, I mean, he got 25 on a regular basis and more, but I think he could have scored those goals when I closed. I don't think there's been anything like them, either before or since then. The 1982-83 campaign found the Dalgleish and Rush partnership at its most prolific as the pair contributed 42 league goals between them. Rush produced the first Merseyside Derby hat-trick in almost 50 years as he grabbed four in a 5-0 demolition of Everton. Another goal from the Welshman, this time in a 3-1 win against eventual runners-up Watford, perfectly illustrated the intuitive relationship between the Liverpool front men. Somebody played it up to me in the halfway line and I turned, I don't know who was, who was marking me, but I turned him in the halfway line and just played the ball in behind. I think it was the boy's name was Sim. Rushy was on it, left foot, no chance. Yeah, we had no chance of it. As I say, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult, it was quite simple uh, because of his movement. Bob Paisley's final season at the helm ended in typically glorious style with two more trophies secured. Liverpool romped to another league title. At Wembley, a superb Ronnie Whelan effort sealed a 2-1 win against Manchester United and another league cup was won before a fitting tribute to the departing manager. Captain Graham Souness ushered Paisley forward to lift the trophy. Bob Paisley retired after leading Liverpool to 20 trophies in just nine seasons. 
His 44 years of service embodied the club's values of continuity and devolution. And it was natural that tradition dictated the identity of his successor. We like continuity. And if there is one word in our language that depicts Liverpool FC, it is stability. We do not like change for change's sake. Of course, when Bob finally decided to call it a day in 1983, um, they decided right away, Joe Fagan's the man, uh, and um, and he was. Joe was a, a great football man, great tactic, common sense. Uh, if you ever had a problem, you go. He was a great manager. He again was kept the game simple, man of a few words, gave us the responsibility, certainly pushed it all on to the senior players. You know, he'd have a go at us and leave the young lads alone, and you know it was up to us to make sure they were taken care of. And, and a very, very clever football person. Maybe I'm doing an injustice here, a very clever man. Fagan's first season saw championship number 15 made official at Notts County in early May. The League Cup had already been won in March. Graham play of the first ever all Merseyside Cup final. In the European Cup, Liverpool made steady progress. Ian Rush's first leg winner was crucial in helping them pass Portugal's Benfica before a tough semi-final against Romanian champions Dinamo Bucharest. At Anfield, a 1-0 win was gained, but it wasn't the only talking point. I got involved with a, one of their players in the first game. He'd been man-marking me, pulling my shirt, and just been a pest, and I lost my temper and did something I shouldn't have done, and he ended up. Um, having to go off at Anfield with about 15, 20 minutes to go. A hostile atmosphere awaited them in the return leg in Bucharest. In the warm-up, every time we passed it to Graham in the warm-up, the crowd were like castigating them, right? Slaughtered. and gave a great performance and um, I mean obviously he was the captain that night and, and it was a, a great display of leadership. A 2-1 She got both of them, and um, we got away with that. But um, it was, to be honest, it was great. It was exciting. The reward was a European Cup final meeting with AS Roma. The odds were stacked against Liverpool as the venue for the game was the Italian champions' own Olympic Stadium. Fagan's men remained unfazed. Craig Johnson. I'd been at Middlesbrough and the big singer at Middlesbrough was Chris Rea and he had this song and I don't know what it is but, but we love it. And, you know, we're standing in the tunnel and, and we're looking at the, the Roma players and he just started singing it. So everybody started singing it and like they, they looked at us and I tell you what, I think it, it like affected them. I think it affected them more than it relaxed us because they'd look at us thinking, well, well, this is a European Cup final. We had no doubts we were going to win that. Everyone else thought we had no chance. That we, oh, you know, we'll win this. It was just we didn't speak about it, but I know that that's how I saw it, and I know that that's how they all saw it. When I say they, the other lads, we knew we were going to win it. Eland's up on the far side, and Rush almost got in there, but it might come for Phil Neal. Phil Neal's early strike was cancelled out just before half time. No further goals meant this was the first European Cup final to be decided on penalties. Liverpool are European champions! Alan Kennedy was the hero once again. Joe 
Fagan's first season in charge brought the historic treble of European Cup, League Championship and League Cup. It was the culmination of an eight-year period in which Liverpool Football Club confirmed its status as a true giant of the European game. Though further triumphs lay ahead, the years between 1976 and 1984 remain a golden age for Liverpool Football Club. It all just went too quickly for me. I loved it, I can remember loving it, but what I would give to go back and have a, a year as a 27-year-old again playing for Liverpool with those lads, you know, we had. They, they were just being very, very lucky. Good players, good habits, good camaraderie, everything about it was fantastic. The laughter, the, the, the laughter in the dressing room was just, that was the best part, it wasn't, it wasn't really the, the, so much the winning, it, it was the times we had winning. The great thing was it was a team, and as you say, a team will get more, will get more success than, than an individual.